All right, boys and girls. Good morning, Ken Smith. Ken Smith Fishing here with Mr. Todd Driscoll. Todd is with uh, Texas Park and Wildlife. Todd, we've not done this. Tell us about your education. Yeah, I uh, I uh, grew up in Kansas. I got uh, got my BS degree from Kansas State University in uh, fisheries biology, and then I got lucky enough to uh, get accepted into graduate school at Mississippi State University. So I got my, my master's in fisheries management at Mississippi State. And you, we were talking yesterday, you joined Texas Park and Wildlife 20 years ago, or is it 25? Right in between there. I, I guess you dial it down, I've got 23 years in. Yeah, I years. actually started with a department up in Wichita Falls in, uh, I believe it was July of 1998. And then within less than a year, I got so fortunate that this job that I have now opened up. So yeah, I've been in this seat ever since. I mean, I've been down here for what, 22 plus years. Just okay. So, so blessed to be here. And your current title is? District management supervisor or, or more functionally, you know, district fisheries biologist. So this is our third conversation, guys. If you've not seen any of the prior conversations, there's playlist on my YouTube channel. The first conversation was just, we just talked about a broad range of subjects, but you told us back then, so that's playlist one. You told us back then about this tracking study that y'all were going to start doing. So our second conversation was in October of 20. Uh, now, to level set, you guys tried to start this tracking program. So it's at, it's at Toledo Bend and at Lake Fork. Y'all tried to start it back in November of 19 but you had some fish mortality challenges and you discovered that that was due to y'all doing the surgery uh, counter to everything everybody had ever known. It didn't matter whether the water was rapidly cooling or rapidly warming. That was stressful on those fish, right? Yeah, it was so unexpected and just so eye opening, right? You know, we, we initially tried to kick the study off in November of that year you referenced and Water temperatures at Toledo, I mean, they were in the mid to high 50s at that point. And, uh, of course, you know, myself and, and the bodies at Lake Fort, Jake Norman, I mean, together we had consulted with numerous other biologists and fisheries professors around the country that, that had done these type of telemetry studies, you know, quite often. And everyone agreed there wouldn't be anything wrong with kicking it off during that time, but admittedly, I didn't really see where any other studies had actually conducted fish surgeries at those colder water temperatures, but common sense told us that cooler water should be better relative to stress and survival of the fish. But boy, I'll tell you, we found out so much differently. And uh, it, it's so rare that you find something this conclusive out here in the real world, you know, with fisheries research. But when we got all done with that initial try at this study, I mean, we had 100% mortality of those fish we did surgeries on, you know, not 90%, it was 100%. And that dynamic, it, to, to my surprise, is just totally undocumented in the scientific literature. Or, you know, if, if someone else would have went down that path, we could have avoided, it, right? Yeah. But So yeah, it was just totally unexpected. And of course, initially, we thought, you know, we may be doing some wrong things or what have you. It's just kind of human nature kind of second guess yourself when you have that kind of mortality but we even did some experimental trials here at this hatchery where we had colder water fish and, and and actually fish that we warmed up in the building here and and pretty much confirmed that it was just due to the those colder water temps and then we double confirmed that here in 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 may and june of 2021 when we when we go go with the second round to kick the study off and everything works wonderfully then right so yeah that's kind of the broad version of that whole story there so the second playlist i mentioned there is we did back in i believe it would have been october of 20 so you had about five months of data so really you had tracked those fish from really late post spawn through the summer and into the fall and does that sound right date wise well not really, no. Uh, well, you know what? Time gets away from me. Yeah, that is right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was thinking a year prior, but no, you're right. Absolutely yeah. correct. Yes, sir. So you've now tracked. So you, you updated me yesterday. Y'all had another surprise in your battery life, right? In your transmitters? Right. You know, we, you know, there's 
not a lot of companies that that make you know radio transmitters for fish as you might expect i mean there's just not a ton of demand around the world for something like that so there's just a handful of companies and we consulted with 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 a couple of those and and lock down on this one transmitter which you have to be careful of is when you do this type of work you know you're you got you have to balance out the size and the weight of the transmitter relative to the size of the fish you're tagging to make sure that you don't get too big or too heavy a transmitter to make sure it doesn't affect the behavior of the fish. Sure. Of course, the smaller the transmitter, in theory, the less battery life you have. So you have to balance all those factors out. But in consulting with the company that we used, he was almost positive we could get two years life out of, out of transmitters. But it ends up that uh, uh, we got about 11 to 13 months battery life out of that first batch of fish that we tagged in in the in the late spring early summer 2021 so luckily we had purchased some extra transmitters anyway so we're actually dealing with two different batches of fish is what it boils down to and i think i've got it in my notes here but i think we have 30 total fish here at toledo bend that we've got plenty of fish observations on to have good data on and it's essentially split almost down the middle between that first batch uh, in uh, 2021 and now our current batch that we're dealing with now. All right, why don't you give us, so when we left last, we were sitting in the fall of 2020. So you and I were both really curious how those fish would react uh, going into the winter and then also into the springtime. So what did you guys observe? And do you recall, Todd, how many fish you had in the study left at that time? Because I don't right now. Well, uh, I'm looking at the numbers from 2020 right now. Uh, ju just a, a quick recap. You know, we tagged 26 total, and this was in May through July of 2020. And um, 12 of those fish died at some time during that following year. Now, now four of those died, we highly suspect, due to, due to the surgery stress. You know, those fish died within three weeks of the surgeries. You know, that's about a 15% mortality rate. And most, you know, when you do this type of thing, you just have to expect about a 10 to 20% mortality rate for surgeries. So that left us with uh, 14 fish throughout the following 10, 11, 12 months there that we gathered enough data on on that first batch, you know, tracking every two weeks. Uh, actually, uh, looking at my notes, uh, we, we found 14 fish pretty much every single time we tracked, but we had a total of 19 fish from that first batch we had good data on. That's what it ended up being. Okay. And what did y'all observe from those fish post-October of 2020? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, a little bit of this we might have already talked about, but, you know, you kind of got to, you know, represent some of these individual fish behaviors over the whole year for them to make really good sense, you know. What we found uh, overall, only three of those 19 during that first year completely left housing. When I say completely left housing, if you were to draw a line out there at the mouth of housing from pretty much just east of Hurricane Creek, straight south to uh, the, that south, pound on, uh, south point on six mile where that bulkhead is and the house on the point there. Only three fish left, left housing outside of that area. So... Uh, they didn't do a whole lot of moving outside of housing. Now, eight of those 19. Todd, let me stop yeah. you for a second. Excuse yeah, me sure. for interrupting you. So those three fish, did those fish show back up? How did you know those fish didn't die? Right. So we actually, you know, we, 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 we hardcore track within housing. I mean, if a fish is inside of housing from that line back in, ha in housing embayment, I mean, we're going to find it. Undoubted. I mean, we have a, uh, a distance to get a hit on a fish, typically worst case a mile, but up to over two miles. And so, for, for guys, guys who don't know Toledo Bend, so housing, I'm going to say where you described it is probably a mile and a half to two miles across at the mouth. Yeah, and that's fair. Would you say maybe six miles deep? That's pretty miles much deep? Yeah, that, that, that's good. That's pretty much exactly what it is from that line. So, and guys, what it does is from the mouth, just like every creek, it narrows to the back. So in the back is Housing Creek proper, uh, where it goes down at some point to bank to bank. So it's a big, I mean, I don't know how many acres that is. I can't do that kind of math, but I mean, it's, it's a lake in and of itself back there. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
And, you know, if, if your viewers recall, you know, one of the main reasons that we did this study was telemetry studies on very large reservoirs like Toledo Bend. I mean, they're pretty rare. In fact, I can only find two others in the scientific literature that have been done on lakes, so let's say 20 to 45,000 surface acres. And of course, Toledo Bend's 185,000 surface acres. So telemetry studies are pretty rare on these large systems. Why? Well, they're just hard to do because fish can flat get away from you. They can be really hard to find, you know, when they have capacity to, to move miles and miles away. Whereas if you do a study on a 2000 acre lake, you've got them hemmed in, so to speak. So very few studies have been done on these large systems. And, you know, the, the other motivation for this study was, was really, you know, the decline in, in fishing quality that we saw, you know, from let's say the 2015, 16 timeframe at Toledo when BASS had it ranked number one all that fishing pressure that occurred during that time and after uh, common sense and even scientific studies just tell you, you know, fishing just gets tougher when you've got all that fishing pressure. I mean, fish just get educated. Again, that's scientifically proven. So uh, very few studies have been done on large systems and, and we had all that fishing pressure. Undoubtedly, the, the fishing quality declined. And one of our questions was on these large lakes, where fish have the theoretical capacity to flat get away from us as anglers? But do they? Do they actually do that? And that kind of gets back to me saying that only three of those 19 fish completely left house, right? Yep. Three of those fish tended to show some behavior that they flat got away and were escaping any kind of fishing pressure, whether that was unintentional or, or intentional, who knows, but they were, they were out in the middle of nowhere, let's say, because when we tracked fish, we left house and we, we ran up to the south point of Indian Mounds area ran the, the river boat lane south, ran the main ma main lake boat run, clear down to the mouth of six mile and back around there. So that's a pretty vast area out there that, that we found some of those fish out there, but you know we occasionally had fish that had moved miles and miles away that we just couldn't find, that did show back up in house. And that was a long, long way around to get to your question, but, yep. and we'll get to some of the specific numbers as we, we move through some of this data, but but yeah, a small percent of the fish did did escape and get way, way out in the middle of nowhere where, where we couldn't even find them. But uh, if you want to, on eight of these 19 fish, you know, we can kind of talk about the individual behaviors that, that anglers may find interesting. We Yes, we will. <laughs> you know, there's not, there's not a lot, you know, I find myself trying to scientifically explain these behaviors. I don't guess there's really any way you can some of these fish just made some movements that just defy just natural survivability mechanisms and biology, right? The first fish, it was a two pound fish. You know, we had several two pound fish tagged. They were the smallest ones that we tagged, but this fish was just highly mobile between the main lake outside of housing and the very back of housing. We initially tagged it in the back around the pipeline area in May of uh, 2020. The fish stayed back in there, clear through July. Didn't move much, but then boom. That fish swam six plus miles outside of housing to where we could not get a hit on it. I mean, August through December, we never got a hit, which means it was way, way out in the main lake or, or, or clear down past six mile or clear north of Indian Mounds. I mean, huge, huge movements. Then lo and behold, December comes back around and uh, we find it on community hole flats out there at the mouth of house. Where it was for four or five months there, nobody knows. Uh, so, you know, that was about a four month period where it was main lake oriented, way, way out there somewhere. We found it that one time in December, community hole flats, then we lost it again. It went out in the middle of nowhere until March, but then boom, the next hit we get, and keep in mind, these are two-week intervals when, when we're tracking, right? We don't know what these fish do when we're not there the two weeks. So once every two weeks, that's what we have inside on. So the next time we find it, it's in the very back of housing, presumably for the, for the spawn, you know, in, in early March. It was only there for several weeks. Then April 1st, it moved from the very back. Over a two-week period, it left the back and was clear out at that community hole main river channel swing on the boat lane 
off of community hold flats. You know, that's over six mile movement. So Todd, do we know if that was a male or a female? No, no, we didn't sex any of these fish. Okay. No. But you know, you, you ask yourself why? Well, there's no logical real reasons why, because so many of our fish, as we'll talk about a little bit later, moved very, very little over the course of the whole year. I mean, Toledo Bend's just a lake that's so productive. It's got so much woody cover. It's so fertile. The forage base is so strong that in terms of what fish need to survive, that fish do doesn't need to travel like that, but it just does. Did, were you able to observe that fish with live scope at all when it was out on the community hall? I don't specifically recall. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we, I asked that question because I was curious if it was wolf packing. I would have the data to dig back in there. Um, you know, I've got all this data, you know, compiled for all the fish together that we'll talk about, but I don't have it available right now to see, you know, in terms of individual fish. But yeah, that's one of the things we're going to talk about. You know, we looked at uh, schooling nature. I mean, how many fish were by themselves, you know, what frequency of the time or when they were schooled up. So we'll talk about a little that a little bit later, but I don't have that available for the individual fish right now. Okay. All right. Tell you what. If we, if we can keep going. I've got seven or eight more fish here if you'd like. Let's, let's do, let's break right there. That's a that's about 15 minutes. That's a great part okay. one. So guys, uh, we're going to break with Todd. Uh, Todd and I are going to keep talking. You're going to see this as part two, but that's part one. We know what one fish are doing. When we come back in a couple of days here, we'll see part two and we'll see what some other fish are doing.